This episode of Engineering the Future is brought to you by Epic Training, supporting engineers since 1992. Epic Training knows the transition to working from home has been difficult for both businesses and employees. That is why we've converted all our courses to online to keep engineers and technologists on track. For more information on how we can help your company thrive, visit epictraining.ca. This podcast is brought to you by OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, the advocacy body for professional engineers and the engineering community in Ontario. Welcome to Engineering the Future, a podcast by the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. I am your host, Jerome James. Today I'm joined by Mark Abbott, a professional engineer, OSPI member, and Managing Director of the Engineering Change Lab, a collaborative platform for individuals and organizations in engineering to share perspectives and to take action to address challenges holding back the profession. Mark, this is a noble goal and aligned with a lot of the work that OSPI is currently doing. Can you start by telling us, in the view of the Change Lab, what are some of the major challenges that are needed to be addressed by the engineering profession. Yeah, um, and it's interesting. The Engineering Change Lab really is more of a, a platform that's made up of different organizations. So OSPI has been a, a key player, a key member of the Engineering Change Lab uh, since the very beginning. So it's really a, a collective exploration and, and, and effort by these different organizations and leaders within to you know, explore these big questions and, and figure out how we can um, sort of evolve engineering into the future. And so um, basically at the root is this, you know, both this pride in everything engineering has contributed to the world and, um, you know, the sense of, of potential for the future, but also this realization that the world is changing really quickly. And if we want engineering to keep living up to its potential, we have to understand the key ways that the world's changing and very proactively kind of evolve engineering forward. Um, you know, and at the root of that, we've, we've recognized that in a lot of ways, your strengths become your weaknesses. So, you know, as engineers, we have this strength that we're practical problem solvers, right? Um, which makes us great at, at, at uh, you know, give me the problem, let me break it down, let me figure it out. Um, the sort of flip side of that is we've recognized that in engineering, there's actually not a lot of critical self-reflection kind of embedded into, um, into the systems of engineering. So as a result, you know, the philosophical questions about sort of, you know, how the world's changing and our role in the world tend to get less, um, less attention within engineering. And I think what the Engineering Change Lab is helping do is bring attention to some of those questions um, so that we can, we can do that sort of bigger, more philosophical sensing and then connect that right down to the, the ground and, and what it means for the potential of individual engineers and engineering organizations. Very interesting. So let's dive down deep into the Change Lab. How does that collaborative atmosphere work? What, what happens in uh, a meeting when you have all these great minds around the table? And, and how, did you, how do you decide who sits around the table to have those conversations? That's a great question. Um, so we launched way back in, in January of uh, 2015. So it's um, been six years now. And um, the lab was originally uh, co-convened by Engineers Without Borders and Engineers Canada. And um, the idea, we were using a social labs methodology. And the idea is that you convene a, a microcosm of the system you're trying to change. So that second question you asked, like, you know, who, who should be, who is that microcosm? Who should we invite? We've been asking and re-asking that question and kind of bringing new people in for the whole six years. When we first launched, um, was the first time we, we went through that exercise, like who is engineering in Canada? So we had everything from, um, you know, professors and deans and students from engineering um, education, K to 12 education, industry and different parts of industry, government, civil society. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of sub branches as well, too. Like in industry, there's manufacturing engineering, consulting engineering, you know, um, data and, and sort of um, Internet technologies or, or information technologies. So um, one of the amazing things about engineering is it's such a a, a large and sort of vast community with all these different facets, which makes it a challenge um, to actually convene that microcosm and to do the work. And so um, we launched with literally 40 leaders from 40 organizations 
sitting in a circle in Montreal. Um, and, you know, circle is kind of the way we normally check in and, and check out of these convenings because everyone's sort of um, in the circle bringing their, their perspective and their views and, and their background um, into sort of a collective sense-making process. So in the early days of the lab, a lot of it was about sort of big open questions like, well, wait a minute, what is the higher potential of engineering to contribute to society? Um, and right in that very first session, there's a, a moment I won't forget where the dean of one of the major engineering schools, a kind of a bit of a frustrating moment where, you know, we were going in circles a little bit, said, um, wait a minute, what is engineering? And there was this like silence where, you know, deans and VPs and directors and CEOs, no one was confident enough in their answer to like fill the silence. And I think really the last six years, like we started out with much more of an open exploration and the six years has really been about starting to understand and put words to what that potential is and, and test different initiatives. So we've gone from, in the early days, it was it was um, a lot of like big picture thinking and sense making with, with some action learning. So we were launching initiatives right off the beginning. But over time, as we've kind of gotten this greater sense of the big bigger picture, our emphasis has shifted towards um, actually um, more fostering the change in the world and understanding what those changes are. Fostering the change. I like that. Um, I know that the concept of technological stewardship has been thrown around um, a lot. Is it possible that you can elaborate on that concept and how the Change Lab fits into that um, philosophy? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, over the first couple of years, as we were asking these bigger sensing questions, what became kind of clear is that um, not only is there like a typically a lack of critical reflection in the engineering community, um, again, as a sort of shadow side of those strengths, um, but when there is sort of questions about the engineering community, it tends to be inward looking. So we'd have people come into the workshops and we'd say, why are you here? And they'd say, well, you know, engineers are losing regard relative to doctors and other professions. And we said, well, okay, that sounds a little bit more like a symptom than, than the actual like root problem. And so what we came to is, is to understand the higher potential of engineering, um, you know, kind of obviously you have to zoom out from engineering and look at sort of the, the bigger role engineering is playing in society. And what we came to is, is actually um, some realizations that I think used to be sort of better known in engineering, but have been kind of like obscured a little bit over recent years. And that's the role of engineering in shaping this bigger relationship between technology and society. Um, so if you think of engineering in a broad sense as the process of creating technology, um, process of creating and applying technology, and technology in a broad sense as the means by which humans adapt our environments to meet our needs and wants. So that's, that's a broad definition of technology because in popular usage, a lot of people these days you know, associate technology with just digital or even just digital gadgets. But if you think of it in this broader way, more the way a social scientist who studies tech and society would think of it, um, it opens, it connects engineering to some really interesting bigger stories. Like when we go to the movies, when we watch TV, when we read books about the future, Almost all of them are cautionary tales these days of our relationship between tech and society, right? And right, it's amazing. Right. You can almost always find a movie or story for every failure mode, you know, whether like there's a, like different Black Mirror episodes, Terminator, WALL-E, The Matrix, you know, they're, they're, it's right in our storytelling as a species that it's, it's telling us that it's critical to get this relationship between technology and society right. And so the realization we came to is... Um, you know, the, the engineering community, the engineering profession and the broader community around it that are the ones creating these technologies that are going to propel us either towards, you know, Star Trek Next Generation or Terminator. You know, it, it got us onto thinking about what, what's it going to take to ensure that that technology is actually beneficial for all. So that's basically where the concept technological stewardship came from. And, and, the, little, and the definition is um, one of the behaviors that help ensure technology is beneficial for all. And we debated, it's funny, as an engineer, you know, coming into all this work, I was like, oh, you know, words, just tell me the definition, I'll look it up. And, and there's, you know, words have static definitions. And what I've come to realize from, you know, my social scientist friends and, and change making friends is actually no language. There's a, a negotiated um, meaning of language over time. Words like engineering and technology actually shift in how they're heard, um, you know, by the general public and by different groups over time. And basically, um, we made a very strategic um, choice to to use the term technological stewardship as opposed to say engineering ethics, which you know for some people would would read engineering ethics in exactly the same way, but in practice what we found is if we called it engineering ethics, it would have kept us in our silo, t 
talking to only engineers and pulling us inward looking. And the ethics uh, pull in engineering anyway at the moment tends to be interpreted in a very micro way as opposed to like the bigger complex societal impacts we're having. So that was that was a, a big point in the journey of the Engineering Change Lab when we kind of landed on that, that framing. And then we spent a couple of years actually sort of understanding the application of technological stewardship. Okay, that sounds great in theory. How do you actually do it? And we wound up coming up with a set of um, behavioral principles, kind of like like guides, so that as an individual, as an organization, if I, you know, these are our hypotheses on the behaviors that ha- actually help ensure te- the technologies engineers create and bring in the world are beneficial for all. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far. At Ospi, we're here for you making sure government, media, and the public are listening to the voice of engineers. You can learn more at ospi.on.ca. Right, interesting. Uh, We have to look inwards to understand ourselves before we can have society understand who we are, is essentially what I'm hearing. Um, And you're creating the tools and and the the processes to, to achieve that. Do you think we'll get to the point where society does properly appreciate engineering for the engineer behind it? Or will we always have the pilot dealing with technology, um, the the lawyer uh, drama and the medical (laughs) drama? Is there going to be an engineer in a drama that... (laughs) Society I, I will want to watch often, on yeah, TV. Yeah, there often are at the moment, but they get misidentified, right? Like I was watching the Mars landing the other day, and like it always gets framed as a big moment for science. We're really, you know, at the frontiers like that. Science and engineering tend to blend, but I would say it was equally an engineering accomplishment as a science accomplishment, for example. But you right. know, it's fascinating. I, I find there's a little bit of like the Maytag repairman, sort of like no one appreciates us kind of engineering thing, and I think that's true. But at the same time, it's also true that we're not getting the type of um, critical friendship from outside engineering either that's saying like, hey, wait a minute, you know, we, you know, the general public saying we've been going into these movies that tell us all the things that can go wrong here. Like, what are you guys doing driving us towards all these, you know, you know, hey, engineering community, what are you doing to make sure we're not driving off these cliffs? So I think it's actually double edged. We're not getting the appreciation, but we're also not getting some of the pressure we should probably be getting um, to actually step up. And I think, I think fixing that will actually be sort of about um, the engineering community seeing its role in a bigger way and in, in, in the responsibility to steward technology and non-engineers understanding that as well, too, I think is going to is part and parcel of the whole the whole change. Interesting. Yeah, hopefully we can uh, see the the um, thoughtful, the thoughtful engineer uh, show <laughs> instead of just Iron Man. Remakes. Well, and it, it links back to this question of what is engineering, right? And I think the changes that we're talking about, we've come to realize are actually embedded in even larger societal changes. So if you look at dominant paradigms or orthodoxies of our of our of society these days, right? It's like, you know, unbridled growth and innovation is the answer to everything. Just more, faster, right. you know, don't ask too many questions because you'll slow it down, right? And that's, that I would say, you know, different kind of, uh, different kind of manifestations is the underlying belief of that's driving most of society right now. But you're seeing the cracks of that come in from, uh, you know, from business where they talk about ESG, from like economics, where they talk about donut economics and capitalism 2.0 in design, like you're seeing, I'd say a whole family of efforts that are basically questioning that dominant, just unbridled innovation growth narrative. And right, ours, I think right. is, is part of that family of bigger changes. For us, you kind of layer on top of that misconceptions about technology. So the dominant view that technology is just neutral artifacts. And therefore, it's okay to train engineers to just churn out neutral artifacts because it's up to someone else how the tools are used. I'd say if you go to the social scientists who study the relationship between tech and society, they'll poke holes all over that argument. And the sort of the the more standard thinking amongst amongst the social scientists right now is, in fact, far from being tech value neutral, there's values embedded in every stage of the inception and development of technology. And then technology actually... Um, shape our values, uh, it, we kind of co-evolve with our technologies over time. So um, right. we shape our technologies and our technologies shape us, to paraphrase Marshall McLuhan. So the first step from our sort of perspective at the Engineering Change Lab is we have to sort of um, engage with and talk about this bigger view of technology and engineering so that we understand 
the opportunity and responsibility we hold in, in, in helping shape that, that co-evolution with our technologies. For sure. My phone has definitely shaped me and changed me. Yeah, out. there you go, right? <laughs> you know, like the, From remembering, one of the exercises uh, we do, like we, we talk about how, um, you know, early inventions, like when humans started using fire to pre-digest uh, food like millions of years ago, um, we actually over time evolved less strong jaws because we were pre-digesting our food, right? Wow. Or, you know, we'll do, we do an exercise in some of our workshops where we talk about the impact of the automobile. And you think about, you know, the impact of the automobile on the suburbs and all of the social norms, like this, this constant kind of co-evolution. Um, you know, I think the new technologies like artificial intelligence, and these things are because of their, their power and their pace, they're making things evident about our relationship with technology that have actually always been true, but were less apparent because they were more gradual and, and, and not quite as like, you know, in your face. Interesting. Very interesting concepts to ponder, you know, um, and uh, I, I feel like we need the language to be able to talk about it more um, in our everyday lives and uh, finding out about uh, the concepts and, and being informed of what's actually happening as it's happening is, is very important. Um, what is happening at the Change Lab these days? Can you tell us about some new <laughs> initiatives that you guys are working yeah. on? Yeah. No, absolutely. So in, in hindsight, when we look back at the last six years, the first couple of years, we kind of call our explorer phase because we were, we were coming to a lot of these realizations. Then the second phase was we were establishing the concept of technological stewardship. So kind of building it out and testing it in different settings and different formats. Like, you know, how do you run a workshop with, with this group? How do you, you know, how do you communicate it to this group? Um, we've over the last year have been transitioning into a new phase of the lab's work. And the goal has become about um, reaching a, a, a critical mass of the engineering community practicing this enhanced form of engineering, like engineering technological stewardship within 10 years. So the social science tells us that a critical mass is about 25% of a system. If you can get 25% of the people in a social system kind of living a new paradigm, a new, a new, new base assumptions about engineering and technology, it'll tend to snowball and get the rest of the system over time. And so 10% of the engineering community, if you, if you take professional engineers, computer scientists, data, you know, technologists, like a, a broader view of the engineering community, 25% um, would be somewhere on the order of like 100,000 people. So now the challenge in Canada. So the challenge is how do we get 100,000 people, as you were saying, kind of like talking this language, connecting, sharing, seeing how our stories are all connected. How do you, how do you get, 100,000 people not just seeing that, but it actually affecting their behavior. So based on that bigger understanding of engineering and, and, and what it's doing in the world, actually, um, you know, stretching to become more inclusive in our work, more regenerative in our work, more purposeful in our work, um, to, be, to be more um, uh, adept at actually um, managing the value tensions inherent in the, in the development of technology, like, like privacy and convenience in a smart city, right? So, right. Um, We've been spending this last year in a little bit of a quieter mode, putting together the theory of change of how do you get to 100,000 in 10 years and the key components of that um, work. And so the three major things that we're working on right now are a technological stewardship platform as kind of a hub for people to come and share their stories of like, I am a tech steward. This is what I, this is how I'm expressing that. And to like weave that story in with other people and learn from each other. Um, then we're working on a, um, to support org consulting offerings. So to help existing consultants to build technological stewardship into their consulting offerings. Because what we've seen is, you know, there's there's lots of innovators and leaders peppered all throughout the system. And, and pretty much every company has got some, you know, one or multiple people who feel this and want to drive it, but they need support. So that's like, how do we actually get, you know, some exemplars kind of running ahead with, with, um, with consulting support in their org context? And then the third kind of main um, offering is to continue evolving our systems level work. So the core engineering change lab, um, some mini labs kind of focused on academia and going deeper on um, how indigenous wisdom kind of affects technological stewardship. So we've been kind of a little bit quieter on these three things because we want to we want to sort of um, launch those as three main ways people can get involved over the next 10 years. Because for the first six years, we actually weren't the goal wasn't scale. Um, we weren't ready to scale. We were figuring all of this out through relationships and conversations. Now, right. after six years, we feel like we're ready to take that out over the next 10 years. And so we've been coming up with like the bigger ambitious plans around those three main offerings. 
So um, hopefully the, the technological stewardship platform should be launching a little later this year. Um, we okay. should be starting to look at sort of org consulting pilots um, later this, uh, well, pretty soon, actually, not even later this year, but relatively soon. Um, something the ECL has done to support all of this is we shifted from being incubated at Engineers Without Borders um, to now being based at Mars Discovery District. And so they have a lot of um, sort of aligned offerings and a deeper bench to scale some of these things. So we just um, shifted to being based there late last year. And so we're really just now getting to ready to ramp up all of these offerings towards that 10 year goal. Amazing. Um, so your average engineer has to hold on and, and wait for the <laughs> hub platform to be initiated or are there things that your average engineer can, can do to take part or at least start thinking about self-improvement or, and, and, um, uh, yeah. uh, giving back or giving into this concept of, of stewardship and yeah, and, I mean, um, yeah, I mean the main way now and in the future that people will be able to engage is through organizations like OSPI, like OSPI has been, you know, part of this for the whole six years. And, uh, and the big part of the, how we see this change happening is all the members of the engineering change lab embedding it back into their core offerings in particular organizations like OSPI, where your core mandate is, was already very aligned with all of this. And, you know, um, Sandro and lots of leaders from OSPI have been involved through the years. So, um, you know, continuing to kind of live some of this through participation in OSPI and everything is, is I'd say the most immediate sort of opportunity. Um, in terms of like direct connection to the engineering change lab, um, at this moment, if, if people want to be sort of appraised when the, the platform goes live and, and consulting offerings are, are available, um, you know, probably you could hear about that through OSPI eventually, but if you want another sort of ear to the ground, you could also, um, people could sign up for the, um, the newsletter on the Engineering Change Lab website, and then they would hear those things as they were coming out as well, too. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm happy for you to have uh, been here today and uh, uh, all the best in all of the uh, interesting work that you guys have planned for this year. Yeah, no, thank you, Jerome. And um, like I said, you know, OSPI is the Engineering Change Lab is as much OSPI as it is anyone. Like you guys have, have played a huge role through the whole six years. So I'm happy to just, um, you know, share the share the wisdom and the progress that we've kind of generated together and looking forward to, to next steps in the journey. Mark Abbott is a professional engineer, an OSPI member and managing director of the Engineering Change Lab, a group of leaders from across Canada, engineering communities, coming together to help the profession prepare for the future. From all of us at OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, thanks for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode.